Ashley Brockery, Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 6. You're fine, Naomi. Tracking down Anna Spinelli was the perfect excuse to escape the post-dinner chaos at home. It meant the dishes were someone else's problem, that he couldn't be pulled into the homework argument that had just begun to heat up between Philip and Seth. In fact, as far as Kay was concerned, rainy evening drive to Princess Anne was high entertainment, and that was pretty pitiful for a man who'd grown accustomed to jetting from Paris to Rome. He tried not to think about it. He arranged to have his hydro foil stored, his clothes packed up and sent. He had yet to have his car shipped over, though. It was just a bit too permanent a commitment. But between the time spent repairing steps and doing laundry, he entertained himself by tuning up and tinkering with his mother's prized Veta. He gave him a great deal of pleasure to drive it, so much that he ac accepted the speeding ticket he collected just outside of Princess Anne without complaint. The town wasn't the hive of activity it had been during the 18th and 19th centuries where tobacco had been king and wealth poured into the area, but it was pretty enough, camp supposed, with the old homes restored and preserved, the streets clean and quiet. Now that tourism was becoming the newest deity for the shore, the charm and grace of historic towns were a huge economic draw. Anna's apartment was less than half a mile from the Office of Social Services, easy walking distance to work, to the courts. Shopping was convenient. He imagined she'd chosen the old Victorian house for those reasons as well as for the ambience. The building was tucked behind big trees, their branches now hazed with new leaves. The walkway was cracked but flanked by daffodils that were ready to pop out with sunny yellow. Steps led to a covered verna, verna, veranda. The plaque beside the door stated that the house was on the historic registry. The door itself was unlocked and the camera led Cam into a hall. Way. The wood floor was a bit worn, but someone had trouble troubled to polish it to a dull gleam. The mail slots on the wall were brass, again polished, and indicated that the building had been converted to four apartments. A. Spinelli occupied 2B. Cam tromped up the cricketed stairs to the second floor. The hallway was more narrow here, the lights dimmer. The only sound he heard was from the muffled echo of what sounded like a righteous sitcom from the television of 2A. He knocked on Anna's door and waited. Then he knocked again. Tucked his hands in his pockets and scrowled. Expected her to be home. He never considered otherwise. It was nearly nine o'clock. A weeknight. And she was a civil servant. She should have been quietly at home, reading a book or filling out forms and reports. That was how practical career women spent their evenings. Though he hoped eventually to show her a more entertaining way to pass the time. Probably at some women's club meeting, he decided annoyed with her. Searched the pockets of his black leather bomber jacket for a scrap of paper and was about to disturb 2A in hopes of borrowing something to write on. On and whiz when he heard the quick rhythmic click that an inexperienced man recognized his woman's high heels against wood. He glanced down the hall, pleased that his luck had changed. He barely noticed that his jaw dropped. The woman who walked toward him was built like a man's darkest fantasy, and she was generous enough to showcase that killer body in a snug electric blue dress, scooped low at the breast and cut high on the thighs. It left nothing and everything to a man's imagination. The click of heels on wood was courtesy of ice pick heels, the same shocking collar which turned her legs into endless fascinations. Her hair, dewy with rain, curled maddeningly to her shoulders, a thick ivory mane that brought images of gypsies and campfire sex to mind. Her mouth was red and wet, her eyes huge and dark. Cinever reached him ten seconds before she did and divulged and delivered a breathtaking punch straight to the loins. She said nothing, only narrowed those amazing eyes, cocked one glorious hip, and waited. Well, he had to work on getting his breath back. I guess you've never heard the one about hiding your light under a bushel. I've heard it. She was furious to find him on her doorstep, furious that she was without her professional armor, and even more furious that he'd been on her mind throughout the evening a great deal more than her date. What do you want, Mr. Quinn? Now a grin, fast and sharp as a wolf bearing fangs. That's a loaded question at the moment, Miss Spinelli. Don't be ordinary, Quinn. You've avoided that so far. I promise you, I don't have a single ordinary thought in my mind. Unable to resist, she reached out to the ends of the of her hair. Where you been, Anna? Look, it's well after business hour, and my personal life isn't. She broke off, struggled not to curse her moment as the door across the hall opened. You're back from your date, Anna. 
Yes, Mrs. Hartleman. The woman of about seventy was wrapped in a pink charlene robe and peered over the glasses perched on her nose. Heat and canned laughter poured out into the hall. She beamed at Cam, the smile like smile lightning the preservation. Oh, he's much better looking than the last one. Thanks. Cam stepped over and smiled like, Does she have a lot of them? Oh, they never. Oh, they come and they go. Mrs. Hartleman chuckled and fluffed her thin white hair. She never keeps them. Cam leaned, leaned companionly on the door jam and joined the sounds of frustration and I made behind him. Guess she hasn't found one worth keeping yet. She sure is pretty. And such a nice girl. She picks up thanks to the market. Sister and I aren't feeling up to going out. Always offers to drive us to church on Sunday. When my P.T. died, Anna took care of the burial herself. Mrs. Hardman looked over at Anna with such affection and sweetness, Anna could only say, You're missing your show, Mrs. Hardman. Oh, yes, she glanced back into the apartment where Tilly was. I do love my comedies. You come back now, she told Cam and Glint gently closed the door, because Anna was perfectly aware that her neighbor would be able to resist peeping through the security hole, but he had a romantic good night kiss. She dug out her keys. You yeah, might as well come in since you're here. Thanks. He crossed the hall, waiting while she unlocked the door. You buried your, your neighbor's husband? Her parakeet, Anna corrected. Petey was a bird. She and her sister have been, both been widows for about twenty years, and all I did was get a shoebox and dig a hole out back next to a rose bush. He brushed, brushed a hand over her hair again as she pushed open the door. It meant something to her. Wash your hands, Quinn, she warned and flicked on the lights. To indicate that he was willing to oblige, he held them out and tucked them into his pockets while he studied the room. Stop. Deep cushions, bright, bold colors. He's tied to the choices meant she had a deep, rude, sensual side. He liked to think that. The room was spacious, and she furnished it sparingly. The sofa was big and plush, enough for sleeping, but there was only a wide, upo one, only a wide unupholstered chair and two tables to keep it company. Yet she covered the walls with art, prints, posters, pen and ink sketches. There were places rather than people. In many of the scenes he recognized, the narrow streets of Rome, the wild cliffs of Western Ireland, the classy little cafes of Paris. I've been here. He tapped the frame of the Paris cafe. How nice for you. She said it dryly, trying not to resent the fact that her pictures were the only way she could afford to travel. For now. Now, what are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you about. He made a mistake of turning. Looking at her again, she was obviously a very annoyed woman, but it only added to her appeal. Her eyes and mouth were sulky, her body braced and challenged. Christ, you're a looker, Anna. I was attracted to you before. I imagine you caught that, but who knew? She didn't want to be flattered. She certainly didn't want her heart beat to pick up speed and lose its steady rhythm. But it was difficult to control either reaction when a man like Cameron Quinn was standing there looking at her as if he'd like to start nibbling at any at any single part of her body, he keep going till he devoured it all. She took a careful breath. You wanted to talk to me about? She prompted. The kid stuff. How about some coffee? That's civilized, right? He decided to test them both by walking to her. I figured you expect me to act civilized. I'm willing to give it a shot. She brooded, brooded a moment, then pivoted on those sexy blue heels. Came and appreciated the rear view. Rolled his eyes toward heaven, then followed her to the spotless counter that separated living room and kitchen. He leaned on it, pleased that the location gave him a perfect view of her legs. Then he heard the electric rumble, caught the amazing scent of fresh coffee. You grind your own beans? If you're gonna make coffee, you might as well make good coffee. Yeah. He closed his eyes to better appreciate him. Oh, yeah. Do I have to marry you to get you to make my coffee every day, or can we just live together? She looked over her shoulder, lifted her bros at his wide, winning grin, then got back to the task again. I bet you used that look to shove me down with enormous success. But me, I like you. So where were you tonight? I had a date. He moved around the counter. Kitchen area was small, no more than a narrow passageway. He liked being close enough so that her scent mixed with the smoke of it. Early evening, he commented. It was going to be. She felt the hair on the back of her neck prickle. He was too damn close. Instinctively, she employed her usual method with many crowded space. She ran red wound was good. Practice move. He murmured and rubbed his stomach back to top on it. Do you ever have to use it in your social work mode? Rarely. How do you want your coffee? Strong and black. She said it to Brew, turned again, turned around, and bumped solidly into him. Her radar, she decided as his hands came up to take her arms, had definitely been off. Or she was forced to admit she ignored it because she wondered how they might fit. Well, now she knew. He deliberately kept his eyes on her face, didn't let them dip down. 
to the small gold cross nestled between her breasts. He wasn't particularly devout, but he was afraid he would go to hell for having laughing thoughts about the framework for a religious symbol. Besides, he liked her face. Quinn, she said with a long ear straight sigh, back off. You dropped the mister, Quinn. Does that mean we're pals? Because he smiled when he said it, because he did step back. She found herself chuckling. Jerry's still out. I like the way you smell at him. Lusty, provocative, challenging. Of course, I like the way Moose Spinelli smells, too. Quiet, practical, and subtle. All right. Cam. She turned, to, she turned, took out two pretty deep cups from the cupboard. Let's stop dancing and agree that we're attracted to each other. I was one. I was hoping once we agreed to that, we'd start dancing. Wrong. She tossed her hair back and poor coffee. I'm Seth's caseworker. You're proposing to be his guardian. It would be incredibly unwise for either of us to act on physical attraction. He picked up the cup, leaned back against the counter. I don't know about you, but I love doing stuff that's unwise, especially if it feels good. He brought the cup to his lips, then smiled slowly. And I, but acting on that physical attraction would feel damn good. It's fortunate that I happen to be very wise. With a mirroring smile, she leaned back on the opposite counter. Now, you want to discuss Seth and stuff, as I believe you put it? Seth, the rest of his brothers, and the situation had gone completely out of his mind. I suppose he'd used it as an excuse to see her. That was something to consider later. I have to admit, coming into Princess Anne to talk to you was a great reason to escape. I was about to get stuck with this duty, and Phil and the kid were already in round one on the homework issue. I'm glad someone's dealing with his schoolwork, and why don't you ever refer to Seth by his name? I do. Sure do. No, not as a rule. She cocked her head. Is that a habit of yours, Cameron? To avoid the personal contact of names with people you don't intend to have an important or permanent relationship with? Her point, he was forced to admit, was a good one, but he lifted her brow. I use your name. He saw her blink, heard her sigh, then she went the issue. What about Seth? It's not about him directly, except I figured we're starting to divvy things up more even handily. Feels the best to keep on him. Keep on Seth. He corrected with emphasis about school because for some reason Phil actually likes school. Then we decided to get somebody to come in and deal with most of the housework a couple of days a week. She still had a picture of him standing in a puddle of suds with a look of baffled fury on his face. Her lips wanted badly to twitch into a smile. He'll be happier. I hope never to see another vacuum cleaner bag. Ever have one rip on you? He shuddered deliberately and it made her laugh. Anyway, Ethan had this brain sore. I'm at loose ends. Philip needs something to occupy him if he's going to be staying here, though he figures to commute to Baltimore for now, so we're going to, we're going into business. Into business? What kind of business? Boat building. She lowered her coat. You're going to build boats? I've built plenty, so has Ethan. And actually, though Phil went over, and actually, though Phil went over to the suit and tie life, he's done some himself. The three of us worked on the skipjack that Ethan still sells. That's fine for recreational, for personal use for a hobby but to consider starting a bis business a risky one at the very time when you're trying to take on a minor dependent he won't go hungry for christ's sake ethan holds his own on the bay and phil's got that desk job in baltimore i could get busy work but what's the point i'm only pointing out that a venture of this nature would consume a great deal of money and time particularly during the first month's stability isn't every damn thing i know what he says cough kept down again face shouldn't the kid learn there's more to life than nine to five in it that there can be choices that you can take a chance how good is it for him if i'm stuck at the house dusting furniture and hating every goddamn minute of it ethan's already got one client and if ethan brought this up you can believe he's waiting from every angle nobody thinks things through as much as he does and since you felt you wanted to discuss this with me, I'm simply trying to do the same, way from every angle. And you think it would be better if I went out and got some nice, stable time clock job that brings a nice, stable time clock paycheck every week? He stopped in front of me. Is that the kind of man who appeals to you? The kind of reports in a nine to five days, day, nine to five days a week who takes you out to dinner on a rainy night and lets you get away at a reasonable hour without even trying to convince you to take off what there is of that dress? She took a minute, reminded herself of what solve anything if they both of them lost the battle with him. What appeals to me, what I wear, and how I choose to spend my evenings aren't the issues here. As Seth's caseworker, I'm concerned that his home life be as stable and happy as possible. Why should me building boats make him unhappy? My question regarding this idea of yours is whether you intend 
fortune will be taken away from him turned toward the newest new business a business that you would I imagine find exciting challenging and interesting at least for a time is that no you just don't think i can stick do you that's yet to be proven but i do think you'll try what worries me is that you're not trying for seth you're trying for your father for your parents i don't think that's a count against you cam she said more gently but it's not a point in seth's favor how the hell did she argue how the hell did you argue with a woman who insists on dotting every eye you wonder, so you think he's better off with strangers no i think he's better off with you and your brothers she smiled satisfied that she had shut him up for the moment and that's what went into my report this idea of starting a boat building business is something new to think about i hope none of you intends to rush into it do you say no i've never tried it why I'd never been on a boat in my life until Ray Quinn took me out. Because he remembered how those eyes of hers could warm with compassion. He decided to tell her how it had been for him. I was scared to death, but too tough to admit it. I'd only been with them a few days. Never figured I'd stay. Took me out on this little sunfish she had back then. Told me the air would do me good. All he had to do was think, and the image of that morning came clear as sunlight in his head. My father was a big man, the mighty Quinn. Built like a bull. I knew that little boat was going to tip over, and I'd probably drown, but he had a way of getting you to do things. Love, Anna thought. It was pure and simple love in his voice. It attracted her. Seemed to need for bit as much as that toughly handsome face. Could you swim? No, but I still hated, hated that he might made me wear PFD. Personal flotation device, seems like. Life jacket. Figured it was for sissies. You'd rather have drowned? Hell no, but I had to make him think so. Anyway, I sat in the stern. My stomach clenched. I was wearing these sunglasses. My mother, Stella, he cracked it for she, for she'd been stealthy. Had dug up somewhere because my eye was pretty banged up and the sunlight hurt. He'd been beaten, abused, neglected, she remembered. One of the queens had found him. Her heart went out to the little one. You must have been terrified. Down to the bone. But I choked on my tongue before I'd admitted it. He must have known that, Camp said quietly. He always knew what was in my head. It was hot, and the humidity was up, so that every time he took a breath, it was like swallowing water. He said it would be cooler when we moved out of the gut and onto the river, but I didn't believe him. I figured we'd just sit there and fry. The boat didn't even have a motor. Christ, <laughs> he laughed when I said that. He told me we had something better than the motor. He'd forgotten his coffee, and even the point of the story drifted away in the memory. We headed out across the water, slow and easy at first. The boat rocked when we turned into bend, and I figured that was it. Game over. This harem came out of the trees. I'd seen it once before, or at least I liked to think it was the same one. It winged right over the boat. Wings spread to trap the air. Then we caught the wind. That little sail filed. That little sail filled. We started to fly. He turned around and grinned at me. I didn't even know what I knew I was grinning back, so I slipped my lip open again. I never felt like that before in my life. Not once. Without thinking, he lifted his hand and tucked her hair behind her. Not once in my life. It changed you. She knew the sick, that single moments, both simple and dramatic, could alter courses forever. There's a daughter, too. A boat on the water and people who were giving me a chance. Wasn't much more complicated than that. Doesn't have to be that much more complicated here. We'll have the kids swing the hammer and put some wet sweat and effort into building a boat. If it's going to be a queen operation, that includes him. Her smile came quickly, fully, and to his surprise, she patted him on the cheek. That last part said it all. It's a gamble. I'm not sure if it's a time or place for one, but... Should be interesting to watch. Is that what you're going to do? He's forward, nudging her back against the counter. Watch me. I don't want to take my eyes off you on a professional level until I'm sure that you and your brothers provide sets with a proper home and guardianship. Fair enough. He moved in just a little closer. Just a fraction till two well-toned bodies burst. And how about on a personal level? She weakened enough to let her gaze skim down, linger. His mouth was definitely tempting, dangerous, and very close. Keeping my eyes on you on a personal level isn't a hardship. A mistake, maybe, but not a hardship. I always figure if you're going to make a mistake, he put his hands on the counter, occasion make it a big one. What do you say, Anna? He dipped his head a little lower. Covered. She tried to think, to consider the consequences, but there were times when needs, desire, and lust simply outpowered Lockett Jake. 
overpowered logic. How? She muttered a cup in her hand. The back of his neck dragged his mouth down on hers, exactly as she wanted. Hungry and fierce and mindless, his mouth was hot, and it was hard, and it was almost heathen as he crushed down to devour her. She gave into it, gave all to it. Moments madness for body ruled mind, the blood roared over reason, and the thrill snapped through her like a whip, sharp painful with a quick shocking burn christ his breath was gone his mind was reeling reflectively his hands dug into the counter before he jerked them away and filled them with her whatever he expected whatever he imagined didn't come close to the volcano that had suddenly erupted in his arms he dragged a hand through her hair a wild curling mass of it fisted it there then plundered as if his life depended on it can't she managed but her arms wound around him back banded around him until it seemed his heart wasn't merely thundering against hers but inside hers her moan was a rumble of desperate delirious pleasure sounded in her throat exactly where his teeth nipped then scraped then dug greedily into flesh the counter bent into her back her fingers bent into his hips as she dragged him closer oh god she wanted contact friction more she found his mouth with hers again plunging blindly into the next kiss just one more she found herself meeting matching his restless the man her sense seduced his senses her sense seduced his senses her name was a murmur on his lips a whisper in his mind her body was a glorious banquet bone to his no woman had ever filled him so quickly so completely so utterly to the elusive of all else let me it was a plea and he never in his life begged for one for god's sake anna let me have you his hands ran up her legs those endless eyes now she wanted she wanted it. It would be easy to take and be taken, but he sees she knew it was rarely not right. No, not now. Regret smothered her even as she lifted her hands to frame a space for a moment longer. Her mouth stayed on his. Not yet. Not like this. His, her eyes were dark, clouded. He knew enough of women's pleasures and his own skills to believe he could make them go blind. It's perfectly like this. The timing's wrong. The circumstances wait someone had to move she decided to break that contact she sidestepped let out a shaky breath she closed her eyes lifted her hand to hold hold him up well she managed after a minute that was insane <laughs> he took the hand she raised brought it to his lips and then with his teeth into her forefinger who needs sanity i do she nearly managed a genuine smile she stuck to him friend. not that i don't regret that deeply at this moment but i do need it Wow, she drew a long breath, pushed her hands up through her. Cameron, you've ever been as potent as I expected. I haven't even started. The smile went, I bet, I just bet. She's back a little more, picked up her rapidly cooling coffee. I don't know as that episode's going to make either one of us sleep easier tonight, but it's about to happen. She angled her head when his eyes know. What? Most women, especially in your position, would make excuses. For what? She looked at the shoulder and promised herself her system would level again eventually. That was as much my doing as yours. I wonder what it might be like to get my hands on you from the first time I saw you. Cam decided he might never be the same again. I think I'm crazy about you. <laughs> no, you're not. She laughed and handed him his coffee. You're intrigued. You're attracted. Attracted. You've got a good, healthy case of lust, but those are entirely different matters, and you don't even know me. I want to. He let out a sort of laugh. And that's a big surprise to me. I don't usually care one way or the other. I'm flattered. I'm not sure if that's a tribute to your charm or my own stupidity. But I'm flattered. But? <laughs> Damn, I knew that was coming. But? She repeated under her set cup. Set her cup in the sink. Seth is my priority. He has to be. The warmth of both compassion and understanding came into her eyes. And it touched something in him that was buried under the healthy lust. And he should be yours. Hope I'm around if and when that happens. I'm doing everything I can think of. I know you are. And you're doing more than most would. She touched his arm briefly, then moved away. I have a feeling you've got more inside you yet. But... There it is again. <laughs> you better go now. He wanted to stay. Even though it was just to stand there and talk to her. To me. I haven't finished my coffee. It's cold and it's getting late. She glanced toward the window. Her raindrops rained like ran like tears and the rain makes me wonder about things i shouldn't be wondering about he winced i don't suppose you said that to make me suffer sure i did she laughed again moved to the door opened it wide to make her point if i'm going to why shouldn't you oh i like you anna spinelli <laughs> you're a woman after my own heart 
You're not interested in a woman going for your heart, she said as he crossed the room. You want one who's after your body. See, we're getting to know each other already. Good night. She did evade when he pulled her in for another kiss as he walked out the door. Vain would have been a pretense, and she wasn't one to delude herself. So she met the kiss with teasing heat and honest enthusiasm. Then she shut the door in his face, and then she leaned back against it weakly, poking it. That wasn't the half of it. Her pulse was likely to stay on overdrive for hours. Maybe days. She wished she didn't feel so damn happy about it. <laughs> End of chapter 6.